Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation's virtual training session on implementing NAPSIG's incident symbology. The session is being recorded today, and we have a couple of instructors which we'll be uh, introducing shortly. The other thing is that all questions and answers will be taken using the question and answer feature within WebEx. Uh, could you proceed to the next slide, please? Chris? Yeah, it's, it's there. Right. So I'm going to do a, a very quick introduction to our instructors uh, this afternoon. We have uh, Chris Rogers, Lieutenant uh, with the Kirkland Fire Department, and he also serves as a technical advisor with the National Alliance for Public Safety, GIS, uh, specifically on incident symbology, pre-planning, as well as some other areas. Chris, would you like to share just uh, a couple words about your background? Yeah, yeah thanks, Rebecca. So, um, yeah, again, my name is Chris Rogers, and I've been in the fire service for 25 years. Uh, I have a degree in cartography uh, with a GIS option from the University of Idaho I got about uh, 22 years ago. And I've been putting it to good use by being a firefighter for the past 25 years. So that's, but it's a passion and a joy of mine, and it's actually a pleasure to uh, advocate for the, the practical uses of GIS and the fire service and public safety in general. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. And we appreciate your, your time and experience today during our virtual training session. And I will be uh, doing a lot of the question and answer moderation, as well as uh, giving you some brief introductions here as well. Uh, and so my name is Rebecca Harnett. I'm a senior program manager with NAPSIG. I've been with the organization for about seven years, going on eight years, and before that worked with the National Association of State Fire Marshals and a variety of different capacities with advanced technology, communications, and GIS. Next slide, please. Great, so for those who are new to our organization, we just want to give you a very quick overview of who the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is. Uh, so our vision uh, as an organization is to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders that are equipped with the skills and, and knowledge to really practically apply technology and data uh, for decision makers to be able to change the outcome for survivors. And our mission is to equip emergency management and public safety with the knowledge, skills, and resources so that they are able to apply those decision support technologies and capabilities in enhancing preparedness and building a more resilient nation. And so we are represented, we have a, a, a national network of, and net, member network of over 6,500 uh, local, state, tribal, um, county level uh, public safety and GIS uh, practitioners, and then we have a board of directors and a variety of different working groups, and today you're going to learn a little bit about the work of the Symbology Working Group specifically and, and have the opportunity to get involved a bit as well. Next slide, please. The purpose of today's training is to provide you all with very basic awareness level training on why and how to implement NAPSIG's standardized incident symbology guideline and symbol set. So we will provide some insights for those of you that are operators and insights for those of you that are GIS professionals and want to understand the, the technical mechanics and processes to be able to implement the standardized symbology. There's a, a few key objectives that we'll be covering today. The first is that you're going to learn what the incident symbology guideline is and what the set, symbol sets are. Uh, and so this is particularly important if what our work is new to you. You'll learn why and how to implement it in your agency to support a consistent language for communicating incident information. You'll learn about recent additions and enhancements to the incident symbology guideline and symbol sets. And you'll gain access uh, to some valuable implementation tools and guidance that we will, NAPSIG will be releasing publicly within the next few weeks. You'll also see how the symbology guideline and symbol set 
are applied in a variety of different GIS platforms and also in other decision support tools and solutions that are used readily in the field by public safety agencies today. Next slide, please. So we do want to cover a couple pieces of key terminology um, in case folks are new to some of these terms. So we included symbology in there for lack of <laughs> a, uh, a better place to just uh, have a common de definition by what we're talking about, which is the study or interpretation of symbols. You'll hear a term called web maps referred to quite frequently, which is uh, for those that might not be GISers, that is a map that is delivered by a GIS that is both served and used on the World Wide Web, so on the Internet. And we will be demonstrating uh, the use of some of those web maps with the symbology. You also hear references to things called GeoPDF, which is essentially, a, it uses a geospatial PDF as a container for the maps and imagery and other data used to deliver an enhanced user experience, such as the ability to, to widely share a map for uh, maybe practitioners and public safety operators that don't have access to desktop GIS and want to view that map electronically without access to the Internet and to the ability to turn layers on and off, which aids in decision-making, ensuring you have the right view. Next slide, please. So I want to mention a little bit about the national engagement that went on and is a part of our incident symbology effort. So to, to help you uh, have a perspective here of, of how we how we do what we do and what we've done is it, we, we have had over 400 stakeholders participate in a survey this year that was a national incident mapping and symbology survey that informed the needs and requirements, uh, both the current efforts as well as our future efforts. We also have a symbology working group that has over 30 different local, state, and federal agencies represented on it, and we also have engaged the private sector as a part of that working group meetings as well. And that really, that national per engagement, that national perspective is very important to the work that we're doing on incident symbology, and the map that you see here is a heat map to, that visualizes the geographic distribution of our stakeholders that participated specifically in the survey earlier this year. Next slide, please. Great, so I will cover really quickly what is our incident symbology guideline and symbol sets, and then I'll be handing it over to Chris. So, Really short and simple, uh, we've produced a combination of different resources that you will learn about today. The most fundamental of those resources is the guideline, uh, and I will mention that first, which is a flexible and scalable framework for use particularly by GIS professionals in developing and applying map symbols. We recognize that while we might have over 800 different standardized symbols, there are always symbols that we might not have or that something may not work for a very specific application and use. And so this framework provides that flexible and scalable basis to be able to modify and create symbols that may not exist or that might not precisely meet your needs. Now, six incident symbol sets, however, are sets of specific and discrete symbols that we have worked with the community to develop to meet specific symbol needs and to help achieve that symbol standardization when possible and feasible for across all emergency response and management functions and across all disciplines ranging from wildland fire to structural fire to urban search and rescue to law enforcement and uh, mass care and other disciplines. Next slide, please. Great. And with that, I am going to pass uh, this session over to Chris Rogers. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. So we really started this process about five years ago as a, a, a small a work group to really discuss how to view a map uh, information for public safety at the local level. And so a group of us uh, firefighters and some law enforcement got together at a conference uh, here in Seattle to discuss how do we like view information on a map and how, how does what exists already like fit in with that. So we started at a very grassroots level, a very local level, which is 
kind of neat because this is kind of the same history that uh, the incident command system started. It started at a very local level. And so over the years, we've expanded that rule or framework, if you will, and, and I'll use the framework and rules interchangeably to develop a uh, harmonized um, symbology effort to, and to create some formal standards. I'll go over it with some graphics here in a little bit, but uh, you know, we definitely have categories of symbols, including hazards, incident symbology, and pre-incident uh, symbology. Uh, all of this stuff is available right now at the NAPSICFoundation.org website. And also, we'll be releasing more uh, content that I'll, I'll describe here in a later slide uh, that I'm really excited about, some tools that will be actually useful for people to actually use the symbology in a variety of different platforms. So why do we use it? Really, the thing is, is that uh, maps are a way to communicate, just like a radio. It, it helps us uh, understand what uh, the other person's saying, what their intent is. It helps us uh, gain uh, efficiencies and mutual aid planning and automatic aid responses. It also helps us cooperate, and that's the big thing in the, in the fire service and public safety in general, is that we need to have one common operating language to communicate. Uh, also, it's um, oh, I see a little comment that my volume is cutting up and down. How if that's better? Go. I'll just go and do that. Uh, I see that. Um, anyway, so so one of the things that we did is uh, develop the rules and symbol set that's consistent. So even though uh, the framework uh, might have a symbol or that does not really recognizable components, that symbol should be recognizable. Uh, to the average user, and I'll explain more about that here in a little bit. So we we didn't reinvent the wheel. We actually, you know, evaluated and researched several different standards and platforms, and really this whole project is a mashup of all of these different guidelines and standards. And so we went from anywhere from NFPA standards to ANSI 415, which is uh, Homeland Security Work Group symbology sets. We actually went international. Uh, Australia has a great all hazards uh, symbology that had a lot of practical uses that so we uh, uh, procured, if you will, some of the the methodologies that they used. And also, we actually used some non-conventional sources. For example, uh, the Noun Project is a open source icon um, sharing site that uh, is open source, and a lot of that symbology went to uh, supplement the UN. Office of Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs symbol sets. So there's a lot of cross-pollination already between the symbol sets, and we, what we did is we just mashed that information together to sort of have a common framework. So I threw this slide up to kind of kind of bring it to, the, to a lot of people, especially in the fire service, but I know it's the same with law enforcement and other public safety agencies, is that we have, we have the same things, but we communicate them differently, and so the goal is to kind of get it so that we understand that what the root is is that this is an ambulance or a transport vehicle that transports somebody to the hospital. And so a lot of places will call it squads or medics or rescue ambulances or rescues, et cetera. And people get kind of hung up on the actual terminology that they use and get stuck on it, but everybody just needs to understand and kind of take a step back that this is actually just a transport unit that takes somebody to the hospital. So. One thing we did and we identified is we needed to figure out what responders needed in, in emergency incidents. So obviously, we need to have, figure out how to get to the call. That's actually the most important part of the job. But we also needed some more information on the map. So we needed to show where things that are located to help uh, uh, resource the incident. We also needed to have things shown on the map that shows uh, problems or things that we can shut off features. Oops, we got automatic. Uh, um, and also we need to identify hazards. And then this last phase, the most important thing, is we actually needed to inform the public. And actually part of one of the sideways, um, one of the added tasks that we had in this last phase was actually public uh, alert and warning symbology. And this is actually something we really didn't consider as a group before. So in this latest effort and from efforts from now on, we're actually considering how do we inform the public through our map symbology. So incident symbology, the framework of that is basically clear or white backgrounds, and that's really kind of geared towards the idea that if all else fails, if you're at an incident you want to draw on a map, you should have symbology that sort of complements that. So 
you know, so we have different categories of this, this symbology. We have incident resources command features. We have unit symbology, which is represented by an oval. The incident resource and command features are a uh, clear circle. We have infrastructure symbology, which is actually introduced new to this um, framework, and that's actually a rectangle, but it's a re rectangle with rounded corners. And then we have NIMS command feature symbology, which is the, the, the location of where the person that's in charge of an incident or or a person is in charge of certain tasks during the incident are located. Additionally, as a side um, standard or guideline, we have exposure symbology. And actually, this, we didn't really create symbology, but this is just recognized by clear text with italics around it. And we use the, the nomenclature, the narrative convention of A, B, C, D, et cetera. So here's some examples of this symbology. And actually, these symbols and standards were self-created base, staging, Firehide are all NWCG standards, same as CAMP. And we just augmented that and kind of expanded it to other symbology as well. So, but, you know, with everything, there's an exception. So, for example, um, we created, and this is actually something we copied from the Australians. They used a dashed line around their symbol to, to indicate uh, something that's in the future, not in use or planned. Also, um, if there's a color, like uh, this hard to explain, if we use clear text around it, in this case, civilian, you know, we, that's something that can augment the symbol. And also we augment the symbol with the use of arrows. Pre-planned features are features that have color to it. And they're derived from NFPA standards. And I'll go through these real briefly, but you see that these access points, ventilation, utility shutoffs, assessment features or alarm features, a water control or water source, things like fire department connections, uh, detectors or building extinguisher systems, which are a flat diamond, and the location of features, which are actually a uh, gray square. But the most important category, and this is actually very um, important to most responders, is what are things that can get us hurt or get us really hurt? And so we actually created a reserved uh, uh, shape of a diamond. And actually, this was sort of a self-defining standard or guideline. Most features are standards that already exist contain a, um, a diamond, such as the NFPA 704 symbol, uh, DOT hazmat placarding, the DHS incident symbology, which actually was re really represented hazard. And even in the common everyday senses, road signs are actually diamonds that um, uh, are a represented hazard itself. So again, a diamond is the reserve shape and the symbols are variable other than the shape. So we actually introduced some new standards, <clears throat> our new um, categories to this uh, guideline. So this last phase, we introduced natural hazards, which are features that indicate a natural event or hazard, and this is geared towards responders. Uh, access hazards, which are commonly road or um, travel hazards that, that may uh, rep be represented by a diamond with some kind of icon. Human-caused threats or hazards, uh, for example, uh, child abduction or radioactive hazards. And hazardous materials, which, again, that was sort of a self-defining standard between DOT placarding and FBA 704 guidelines. And then we have an ad hoc uh, category of specific hazards, and these are just iconic um, uh, hazards that can be represented for local responders. And again, this is uh, very subjective. It depends on what you deem as a hazard. Uh, some, everybody has some common hazards like building collapse and fall hazards, but there might be other places where uh, an example would be some places um, for fire service, you know, trusts. Trusses are kind of a hazard to their community and to other fire departments, it's not. It's actually something that's kind of working in condition to. So you can represent that hazard based on the need that you assess for your community. So what's new in 2015? So again, we expanded to natural and human caused uh, hazards, which is something that we did not uh, tackle before. And these are both diamond shaped features with uh, black outlines. And they note a specific hazard that occurs or is present at an incident. So some examples of those that we created are avalanches, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, and landslides. So you notice that for all these symbols, they have some treatments, if you will, or some 
outlines that are different that indicate some kind of status or risk of a hazard. For example, avalanche uh, warning ha hazards are indicated by the same kind of icon in the middle, but a dashed line surrounding it. And if there's an avalanche watch, it's a dotted line or surrounding it. Same with um, flooding and same with hurricanes and landslides and to a certain extent with earthquakes, mainly for aftershocks. In addition to that, we have, we have a volcano symbol, a snow event symbol, tornadoes, and windstorms. The uh, consistency, uh, it's very similar with volcanoes and tornadoes as far as using a warning or watch scale. The windstorm, we uh, cho chose a different scale uh, based on the, the needs that we've identified. Uh, you know, we had created a dust storm treatment, which is with a D on the upper left-hand corner and the uh, S for sandstorm on the upper left-hand corner. Now for the human-caused threats and hazards, these are things that are may or be accidental or may be intentional, but uh, we created some symbols for explosions, structural collapse, hazmat release, child abduction, radiological, and fire. For uh, the first four, we really didn't actually identify any specific or uh, additional treatments in this phase, but for fire, we evaluated several treatments for the symbol of including icons that relate to a certain type of fire uh, in the middle of the icon, for example, commercial, wildland, education, residential, and industrial. Also, a radiological has a, a treatment for nuclear power plant compromise. And this was, uh, originally this was, these were two separate categories, but since both relate to radiological incidents, we combined them and decided that the treatment of a nuclear power plant would be for radiological. So then infrastructure symbology, and this is actually just the beginning start of the symbology we created for infrastructure. And again, we created um, uh, symbols for airports, bridges, bus stations, ferries, rail stations, uh, stadiums, transportation hubs, and tunnels. And this is actually, again, just, we, since this was a new category in this phase, we actually kind of view this as a starting point to expand the, the guideline further into other, other symbols. And we actually self-expanded to public safety infrastructure symbols of police stations, fire stations, uh, EMS only stations, and hospitals. And again, these are noted by a um, rectangle with a curved corner. Now the next phase, next category that we uh, actually developed symbols for was public alert and warnings. And actually, this was actually an interesting challenge for us because we uh, really didn't consider in our work group uh, any information um, public alert warning information to the group. And so we connected with the FEMA IPAWS group to discuss how we cross-pollinate efforts with a common symbology. And so the key thing with this, or the key takeaway with this is that we created a different shape on the outside, but kept the icon in the middle so that when there is uh, symbols that mean the same, that represent, for example, earth avalanche, uh, earthquake, or child abduction, that the icon means the same but that the intent or the treatment of surrounding us is different. So we have symbols for avalanches, those are warnings, child abduction emergencies, civil emergency messages, which are general uh, civil, civil uh, messages for emergencies that may or may not be covered or categorized, uh, dust storm warnings, earthquakes, and fire warnings. In addition to that, we created uh, hurricane warnings, uh, law enforcement warnings, which there might be some law enforcement activity associated with in a certain area, a nuclear power plant compromise, presidential emergency alert notifications, which are a um, uh, extreme emergency warning that the president declares. Um, also a shelter in place warning, I'll come back to that here in a little bit, but uh, radiological tornado and flash flood or flood warning. Now all of these are indicating some kind of event or some kind of warning to the public. The shelter in place warning uh, is actually a warning of, uh, or a call to action. And so in the future, I think what, we're, what we might end up doing is kind of helping the categories of split warnings to the public and then actions to the public into two, you know, two, um, two separate categories or two separate plans being consistent with the IPAWS uh, and FEMA um, uh, efforts. So here's an example of a public alert area, and, and, and we use actually, and I'll demonstrate that here in a later slide, but we actually use a combination of polygons and points to symbolize a, a public alert. So for example, on the left-hand part, you see a um, 
a dashed line surrounding like a, a potential flood area around a certain reservoir. And actually at that point is actually tied directly to that polygon. So if I draw that polygon in certain depths, in certain mapping applications, I could actually have that symbolized by point. So the area indicates the the area or the volume of the emergency consumed, and then the point actually indicates the value of what that warning is. And then the uh, bottom right hand corner I have an example of just using the point directly. So I guess one of the questions it has is how do public alerts and warnings relate? So, the, you know, so we decided that public alerts and warnings may or may not be about a specific, cat, specific location. Uh, it could be, but may not necessarily be. And also it's used for the public. And it could be, and should be used mostly on public information maps and maybe use the to, on situational awareness maps to track where alerts and warnings were issued. So it could be part of a common operating picture map to to see where some of the big stuff is happening, where the main hazards are happening. The diamond-shaped hazards are more specific in nature, and they depict the hazard threats either with either major risk of occurring or uh, if it's recently occurred with the actual impact of the incident. And also, it, it's used mostly for public safety information. So we wanted to kind of separate that out a little bit because public diamond-shaped hazard symbology indicates something specific public alert warnings will indicate something specific, but can be general to the public. In the next phase, and we kind of touched on it this phase, but we actually discussed color ramping or color, um, um, attaching a color to a symbol based on either the severity of the incident if it actually occurred or the risk level if it's predicted. So for example, uh, if it's a um, minor, you, you'll see this, this color scale comment for for risk of wildland fires, for risk of tornadoes, for risk of um, uh, other items. And actually it's just a col common color ramp scale from from no color through green to yellow to orange to um, red and dark red or purple. And some, some scales will indicate it as black. We also apply that to polygons as well. And it's the same thing. For example, in the image on the right, we use the red shade to indicate hot zone, which is a common color associated with with um, a hot zone or a red zone, if you will. And then the yellow zone is uh, the warm zone, if you will, in hazmat terms. So here's an example of some color ramps. See, on the left-hand side, you see a color ramp of tornadoes from EF1 to EF5. Uh, EF0, actually EF0, excuse me, indicating really a minor tornado or minor damage to uh, an EF5 with a red shade. Uh, and then on the image on the right, you see, again, the same thing. The, that red could be a hot zone if it's a hazmat incident, it's an inner perimeter if it's a law enforcement incident, or it's a fire perimeter um, if it's a wildland incident. Same with the warm zone. Uh, the warm zone could be, uh, the yellow zone could be a warm zone, outer perimeter for a law enforcement, or a transition zone of some kind for like wildland fire. So the other thing with this symbology effort that really no other symbology group tackled was lines and polygons. And so we actually ex explained a little bit of the polygon symbology with the color ramping and with the great efforts of Chris Johnson, we came up with some line symbology as well. And what, what we wanted to do is kind of, again, match up the efforts of having point symbology representing the type of feature and the line indicating some kind of action. In this case, for, we have a, road closure category with a solid line indicating a full closure and a dashed line indicating partial closure or limited closure. It could be limited closure based on local access or it could be emergency uh, access only. And then we have restricted routes for emergency routes only. So in this example, we use a dashed blue line with arrows to indicate the direction of travel. And uh, we identify that line with a marker to indicate if there's a specific reason why that, that route of travel is, is important. In this case, it's an emergency vehicle, and you see the, the uh, blue star of life in a circle uh, as the mark in the background. And then we have evacuation routes. And if you notice on the top hand, top part of the screen, you see it's green with a circle uh, marker around it with a hurricane. That actually is sort of to emulate the actual road signs that exist for uh, hurricane 
uh, evacuation route. There's also some similar signs for tsunami evacuation routes. And so we wanted to actually have that sort of a pre-planned route for evacuation to the public. And so then and I'll, an example I'll show uh, at the end of this, I'll show how you can uh, iterate or migrate from a pre-planned evacuation route. And then if it's activated, you can change some values in the attributes and change that to a red line with a uh, diamond-shaped um, hurricane symbol. So the resources we've developed, uh, and we're still getting ready to release this uh, next month, but we've, we've uh, exported uh, roughly around 800 images of various kinds for pre and planning hazard mapping, uh, incident symbology, for use of both um, web maps and also uh, other mapping applications like Google Earth. Also, we're using, uh, we developed some true type fonts for use in GIS software, and what's nice about that is that you can actually layer the fonts on top of each other to create some complex symbology. And then we're, we're releasing some style sheets, some map packages, uh, which are uh, packaged map documents that are Esri map documents, and some layer files that <clears throat> contain the, the individual feature class and the, the symbology of the layer, also some labeling that techniques that we've developed, and also some sample map templates. So from there, I'm going to go into a couple of demo, uh, demonstrations. So I want to show uh, how a department that does not have any mapping resources whatsoever can like use Google Earth to actually map an incident using the symbology. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, and Rebecca, go ahead and give a thumbs up if you can see the um, Google Earth and my desktop change. I sure can, definitely. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So on, on the pane on the left, you'll see Google Earth. And again, it's a free application you can download. And uh, what I'm going to demonstrate is a small department that has no mapping resources. And they want to actually communicate a landslide uh, information both to the public and to the responders that, that, that are coming in. And then the right-hand pane, I have a um, this, uh, basically a temporary website set up with symbol information that I could actually port into this map. So let's say, for example, you see on the map already, you see a diamond for landslides. You see an area feature that's shaded red. I just used the the uh, the add polygon feature built into Google Maps to create a, uh, a polygon KML um, shape. And then, of course, the point features, I just created a uh, place mark or point, if you will, to indicate some features like command post, staging, the land site, and the land site alert. Now, one kind of tip for using Google Earth to manage your information, you do not want to, unless you have skills in like fusion tables or something like that to actually manage a ton of points or information directly in Google Earth, but this is really for simple maps that you want to communicate directly to uh, somebody else. Also, I really would emphasize the use of folders to manage your information so it doesn't get too wieldy. So for this demonstration, I'm going to actually go ahead and add, uh, communicate to the public that, hey, you know what, I want to tell where the media needs to show up. So I'm going to right click on this uh, folder, hit add, I'm going to hit add place mark. And you'll see that that thumbtack actually shows up directly. So I'm going to just title this media. And then from here in Google Earth, I'm going to tap this uh, button that says uh, th the thumb print or the uh, thumb tack. And you notice that it gives me a standard palette of symbols, but I want to add something kind of custom. So I'm going to go down here to my uh, a list of symbols I have. This is just, again, just a mock-up of uh, something similar we're going to implement here in the future. But I want to implement, I'm going to use the the NAPSIG uh, framework symbology to add a symbol to the map. So I'm going to actually copy the image location. And the, the functionality we'll have in our future application, hopefully it will be easier so we can actually just copy the link to it. But what this function does in Firefox is copy the image link. And then I'm going to add a custom icon on the bottom left-hand corner, paste that link in, you'll see that's the link to the image uh, that's actually off my local computer, but it works the same for a website. And you notice that actually it's shown in the current palette. 
hit OK, hit OK again, then I can communicate to the public or to the media that this is the meeting spot for public information requests related to this landslide. Okay. Let's go back to the slides here real quick. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, we, we had one comment um, that I think is a great one, uh, Chris, for you to, to be aware of, which is uh, identifying that you can bring ArcGIS public, published services into Google Earth, and that might be an easier process. Um, and the one thing I did want to highlight is part of the intent here of demonstrating the capability in Google Earth is that we're trying to show uh, the integration and application in a variety of different platforms for those that may or may not have an ArcGIS um, capability as well. And we'll be sharing some other platforms um, as well in a little bit. Um, anything you'd like to add on that one, Chris? No, I think that kind of covers it. Really, the, the intent of that demonstration was to show um, the fact that you can, um, for free out of the box, use something else, and it's for the the guy who really uh, has no GIS knowledge whatsoever, or the small fire department that uh, this is all they have. The only, and again, I, and, and you said it, Rebecca, definitely emphasize that uh, if you're actually dealing with a lot larger data, you definitely need to have GIS resources to either support um, viewing that information in Google Earth or viewing that information in another a mapping application. So again, for this demonstration, we kind of demonstrated that you can actually copy the link from a website, and, or if you will, uh, a palette of symbols into your Google Earth applica uh, application. You can also do this in ArcGIS Online as well. Uh, it's really nice if you want to just create a simple map with map notes and symbolize it, you can actually use the same technique as well. And uh, also in, here in a bit, we're going to demonstrate how to use uh, paper maps and map templates to export from uh, desktop into a geo PDF. So, next slide. Again, it's uh, emphasized it's, it's good and it's free to use. Now, let me, uh, the next thing I want to show is a more robust template in ArcGIS Online in the this presentation. And I'll show, um, it, there, on our NAPSIG uh, ArcGIS.com account, we have several examples of ways you could use the map, uh, templates, uh, feature services, and other information. And actually, it's a very handy way to view and share information on, on a map. And so for a scenario that we came up with, we came up with a hazardous materials release uh, in Washington, D.C., the north part of Washington, D.C. And the thing that I would emphasize with this is that it, this is a template that's built in Web App Builder. It didn't, I didn't code anything at all. It's something that I built. It took me, uh, if I were telling my fire chief, I would say it took me about three hours to do, but if I was telling my friends that it took me about 15 minutes to do. And it, uh, that's, that's the problem of no laughs, darn. Anyway, so anyway, so you see here, this is an application that you can create that's, that's usable by most users. In this case, I include some features of uh, a legend. Uh, ways to edit and view the map. And so if I wanted to add a feature to this map, I could hit this button and say, for example, I want to add a barrier, which uses a circle X, which is actually one of the symbols that we borrowed from the Australians. Click on the map. And fortunately, yeah, there you go. So I ended up adding two accidentally. I could change the attributes of that feature to mercy access only, hit enter, and it changes the label on the map. So I can actually edit. This is actually editing real GIS data that can consume either in a web map or um, a desktop page map. Now, the other benefit, and this is something I'd highly encourage, you'll notice that the, you see these grids um, with different numbers in it. If you're not familiar with it, this is the U.S. National Grid. Now, what the U.S. National Grid is, even though we're talking symbology uh, as a way to, to visualize and communicate information through different types of symbols, the U.S. National Grid is a way to communicate location in a standardized form. And I won't go into too much details about that. NAPSIC has some great resources 
on how to use the U.S. national grid. This is a grid that covers all of the United States and in reality, the rest of the world, it really is, uh, if you're in the military, it's the same as the, uh, the, the military grid system. So here's an example of an application that's device agnostic. I can use this on a tablet, uh, a um, uh, web uh, website, or I could use this uh, in any other, uh, or on a smartphone. So, so this map indicates uh, some key features. It indicates the emergency routes into the incident, the uh, public alert area indicating shelter in place, and I augmented the shelter in place feature with uh, icons that show shelter in place, and then also evacuation routes. So are there any questions on that at all? Okay. I'll cue the next slide here. So again, this uh, I show this. This is actually if you go to napsig.maps.arcgis.com, it's actually there on our title page. And actually, if you wanted to mess with it, it's actually there for. Uh, Shown for the public or people uh, for uh, people from this uh, webinar to mess with. So again, the, the and I, maybe uh, sorry, Chris. Maybe we want to just mention that we we'll also have the workflow document to be able to stand up a similar web app applying the symbology that we will be releasing with the tools later this year that we'll be talking about in a little bit. Absolutely, that's a good. That's a good key. I'll, I'll go ahead and show uh, the example of those templates after I show. The GeoPDF. So, the next thing I wanted to just demonstrate is actually the use of actually just a PDF document. And here's one uh, key thing with this: this is actually not only just a PDF, but actually a, a document that actually gets quick players on and off. And again, in our demonstration, you, we use the national, the U.S. National Grid to indicate uh, location of features on the map. So let me bring that up. So for, for on the resource, uh, the resources that are shown actually are different examples of the same incident briefing map. In this example, this is a general briefing map of the whole area showing, again, emergency routes and evacuation routes and road closures into the incident. Now, if you look in the left-hand side, you'll see a pane open that appears to have layers associated with it. So actually, if you wanted to, as an end user, not uh, needing any special application, just Adobe Acrobat Reader, you can click these layers on and off and reprint it off for a particular audience. You can also click layers, elements of the map on and off. And actually you can click some of the numbers surrounding it on and off in case it can find it not very useful. The other key thing, and this is for everybody, is you definitely want to make sure that you consider when you create a paper map, the audience you're using, the, what task or detail the, um, the uh, map viewer is, is looking at. For example, in this example, this is a general briefing map of, or, of the whole area, just showing some key information, command posts or base and where staging is at. In this example, this is actually a blown up view of the uh, command area, and you'll notice more information. You notice uh, some NAPSIG uh, framework symbology for treatment areas. You notice that there's a, a civilian staging area over here that indicates uh, family reunification. This color guideline on the treatment uh, dots indicates the level of severity of the patient. In this case, it's a red patient or severe patient, and a green patient over here, which indicates a non-emergent patient. Also, you'll, if you notice up here, it indicates um, a decon location for where hazmat personnel could be decon, the containment features uh, icon right here, and then also the actual location of the the uh, incident right here. And so this is actually this map geared towards the responder, but carrying some of those same uh, features to another map. I actually have a map of the evacuation area, and so you notice that. They indicates two features, the evacuation route, where the public uh, media is, uh, uh, PIO is stationed at, and the preferred uh, transport route to the hospital. 
and as far as an evacuation shelter feature here at the university here in DC. So those are three examples, and those are really functionally three the three same apps three times, but uh, with some querying and with some um, layer visibility, it shows uh, it's it's geared towards different audience. So I'm switching between. Switch back to the presentation here real quick. So again, you know, so this instead of the scenario that we used for this MAT template, we used a um, combination fire and police uh, incident and they dispatched a suspicious container and we indicated features that both that were both pertinent for both police, fire, and the public. So here's some common questions that um, that may come up is how do I use, and, and Rebecca I'll go ahead and show some of the other resources um, after this slide, but uh, how do I use um, a hazard feature related to public alert features? And Technically speaking, we actually can represent the same feature twice, one symbolizing a public alert feature. Uh, we could actually toggle a attribute in the attribute editor. If we want it public, it'll change the symbol to a public alert. Uh, another question that might come up is, when will the website be available for symbols? And right now we're actually working on, on it and hope to have it up sometime in the next month or two. And you'll all be notified with that. And the third question may be, how do I create my own symbols? We actually have some resources to help you through that. We have, to, to create a symbol, we have a, a, a technical implementation guidance, and this is geared towards the, the GIS or geographic geospatial professional to help kind of a decision matrix on how do you create a symbol if you don't have one. And so, indicates like what kind of shape you should use or what we should start with, some of the questions you should ask, ask yourself before you start the map, and then some um, icon standards or abbreviations that you may use. Also, we have a quick reference guide that, uh, again, it's for either the lay user or the G um, GIS professional to help kind of explain what this symbology represents and how the framework is, is, is is created and actually these are basically, it's just a rules document indicating uh, if a symbol's a certain way, it, it, it should look like this or if it's um, a feature that is a shut off feature, it should be a, a triangle that's blue in color. Okay, so I entertain some questions right now. Okay. Great. And uh, um, Chris, if we could go back to the slide deck really quick mm -hmm. um, and go to the next slide there, please. Yeah. Excellent. So I think we what we wanted to highlight today is those additional tools that we'll be making available in addition to those discrete symbols that we will be providing out in a couple of different formats. So there's a technical implementation guidance document, which is the one that Chris just shared with you. And then earlier mm -hmm. on you saw um, a basic version, we're calling it a beta version of an implementation guidance for operators. So if you are a non-GIS professional, you can get at least some basic information that you would need to be able to take to your GIS professionals and start to get them using it. Um, we've also shared some of the different map templates, both paper geo PDF, as well as ArcGIS Online and those example workflows using uh, Google Earth as well as ArcGIS Online. Um, and then I do want to make sure that you all are aware that we will be releasing a geodatabase schema um, that supports the symbology. It is a first version of a geodatabase schema. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you want to pull that up, but you're welcome to really quick. Um, we won't go into detail on it today, but we did have several folks have asked that question so far this afternoon. 
Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I got a show, but it's really just a, a wall of words. Uh, we'll release both a, right. um, a web page description of the different domains and features attached to it, and also uh, an XML that you could actually import in and create a geodatabase off of that and start from there. Excellent. Next slide, please. All right. Are you able to switch the next slide, please? Uh, do, you, do you want the library, symbol library tools? Yeah, it, I think it's the next slide, right? Yeah, it's, it's up right now. Okay, I think there's a delay on, on my end. Um, okay, yeah, there we go. So I know Chris talked about this a little bit. We want to let you know this is coming soon. It's going to be embedded within NAPSIG's website. What we're trying to work on accomplishing is easing the search and readily discoverability of all of the discrete symbols as well as these valuable tools for your implementation. And also to help you automate your use and integration of the symbology within any of your existing software and or solutions. Um, we're planning the initial launch of the symbol library and all of these supporting tools uh, within early October timeframe. Uh, we will say that this, it will be a, a prototype version, although it will have basic functionality for search and, um, and integration, but over time we will be working to uh, ongoing enhancements and features and more advanced um, API options as well. Um, so, so that's certainly in the works, and then over the course of the next year and moving forward, as we um, add in different additional symbols, they will be automatically added within the, in the symbol library, and as we make additional map templates available, they'll be available through there, as well as any updated implementation guidance. So it's really going to be a living, evolving thing. It will be completely publicly accessible. Um, and that's really important for us to mention, no login, no cost to be able to use it and to access it. Um, so, so we're pretty excited about it. Um, I did get a couple of questions regarding formats of symbols, and I did want to highlight here. You can see down in the bottom of this diagram, um, we highlight a few of the different types of uh, symbol formats that were initially uh, will be rolling out as a part of this, uh, which includes Esri style sheets. I know we uh, mentioned that, and we do have the the previous version of our Esri style sheets are available on our website under the news and notes section if you go back to the January feed under news and notes. Um, but we will have all updated versions of the symbols in those multiple formats uh, as a part of the rollout of the tool. Anything else you want to mention there, Chris? No, I think I think it'll be an iterative process, and I think we'll be um, uh, rolling out some features iteratively over time. And some of the content you see, the technical guidelines and the technical documents, will become content on the site as well. Great. Um, the other question I've had on here, I've had actually quite a few folks ask about, can you provide symbols for possible addition to the symbol library? Um, at this point, we won't have a, a set up workflow for submitting those symbols within the symbol library. But um, what we will be doing in a moment is sharing with you some information about how you can get involved with this effort. If you have ideas of specific symbol needs and requirements that are unmet, I know I've captured a few in the Q&A area, let us know, um, because we absolutely want to take those into our planning efforts. Um, if you actually want to get involved in the Symbology Working Group, um, we will certainly take considerations for additional members of the Symbology Working Group, assuming, you know, we, we maintain a national perspective and good geographic and discipline representation. So just a couple of plugs there for those. Do you want to move on to the next slide, Chris? Yeah. Great. So I think we talked about this a little bit already and stuff. You know, we definitely have some gaps to fill. And again, this is a starting point. Um, uh, I definitely have some uh, guidance to, to create some symbols for HSIP data leaders, which are is a national data set, and uh, fill out some of the critical infrastructure of public alert and warning event codes, and also. Uh, and I definitely want to encourage just more law enforcement feedback. I, we we really welcome it. We uh, and really looking forward to that. 
Uh, again, also migrating from a guideline to a standard to help uh, some integration with the ANSI standards process. And with Esri itself, Esri's been a great partner with this in helping us uh, coordinate some efforts so that some of this product will uh, eventually end up in their, to their uh, product line. And again, um, more symbols and library tools coming up the next phase. Excellent. So well, I guess the big question we have for you as a group is, you know, give us your feedback. What what priority symbols do you need or do we do we do you want to see? Um, Rebecca was kind enough to provide her email there. Um, and so uh, please, if, if you have any feedback or, or questions or, you know, questions or needs that need to be addressed, uh, send us an email. Um, and also I wanted to give a big thank you to the, these people on the list. These were actually members of our Symbology Work Group. I also wanted to give a special shout out to to Steve Polikoff and uh, Chris Johnson who are very integral in, in to, uh, this process to help us create uh, the expanded guideline and standard for our work group. So. With that, I wanted to thank you for your time. And again, thank you for your interest in, uh, sometimes it's kind of a boring subject, but it's actually a subject that could actually help us communicate better in a geographic fashion. So uh, with that, Rebecca, I'll turn it back to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. So we've got about three more minutes remaining, and I want to take the opportunity to answer some additional questions that we've received in the Q&A feature. So we've been periodically answering a number of those questions um, within the Q&A, so you might want to check back at your, your responses there. Um, there's a couple of other questions I, I'll add here that we may or may not have the answers to, but I'll at least um, share them with our instructor today. So the first question is, does the new symbology incorporate existing ICS symbology specific for oil spills, U.S. Coast Guard, and wildfire, wildfires, NFCC? Definitely, definitely yes, on the, on the wildfire, with the exception of uh, we didn't touch um, line or polygon symbology um, because it was so task specific. One of the, the goals we have is is uh, in this work group is to look for commonalities between different skill sets, if you will. And so for the line symbology and the polygon symbology, definitely defer to the NMWCG standard and we're not even touching that. Uh, as far as the oil spill symbology, the ICS symbology should be the same with both NWCG and oil spill symbology. But beyond that, we have not touched too much into that realm. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, there's another question that we have here regarding the geodatabase schema, which is, are plans for the geodatabase schema closely matched to the Esri local government info model? Um, yes, to a certain extent, yes. There's a lot of cross-pollination, uh, but it, you know, there's also a lot of gaps. So you'll notice that if you look at it, um, there is, um, um, some inconsistencies between the two. And that's one thing we're striving to work on between our partners at Esri and us as well, so. Excellent, thank you, Chris. Yeah, we do have a, a lot of ongoing work too that we should mention with Esri. We have uh, quarterly meetings with uh, Esri Symbology team to be able to work our symbol updates into their software platforms. Um, obviously, we're looking to expand that to include other solution providers as well, but obviously in the immediate, we have been working with Esri on that. And I think that that coordination and alignment that we have is an important one. Um, another question that I want to be sure that we cover here uh, is, I see a lot of symbols dealing with points and lines, but are there some areas that might need to be symbolized, such as evacuation areas for fires? How are you dealing with it, those? Yeah, you know, we haven't really ventured that far into it yet. We we actually um, want to tie uh, public alert warnings with public action and evacuation being an action. Uh, I think that's something we'll kind of tackle in the next phase, but we did not tackle that this phase yet. But you'll you'll see, uh, for example, a purple dashed line representing an area and then the, the action required for that area to be evacuation. Uh, but we don't have, we didn't have the uh, 
capability to define that symbol specifically that was consistent across the board? That's a good question, though. All right. Director, do you have anything else? Or? Excellent. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Unfortunately, we don't have time today to take any more questions, but if you have any burning questions, please feel free to send them, and we'll work to get you answers turned around. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we do encourage you to share your input on any needs and requirements that need to be filled, and also to, to share any other standards or some any other simple work that's going on. We definitely want to know about it so we can make sure to incorporate it in our future efforts. And last but not least, I do want to mention that we will be making a recording of today's session as well as a PowerPoint for today's session available on our website. And we will send all of you a link um, to where that's going to be located. Additionally, as soon as we have all of the templates, tools, and the first version of the symbol library up on our website in the coming weeks, we will send you all a link and information so you can go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone again, and thank you, Chris, very much for your time and expertise today, and this concludes our virtual training. Thank you.